Hey, everyone. Hey, before we get started, I want to tell you about a new series we're starting at the New Stack. It's called The Tech Founder Odyssey. And it is about that journey that technical founders go on when starting a company. This is really about their stories, their journey, the adventures, the tragedies, the people they meet, the scary things that they come to meet along the way. It's really all here for you to learn about what these companies are like when they get started, how people grow them, how they manage them, how they manage their lives along with the journey. We've had some great feedback on Twitter already with some great questions, and we're going to bring those into the show. We hope you enjoy it. Again, it's the Tech Founder Odyssey on the New Stack Makers. You're watching the New Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more conversations and articles, please visit the newstack.io. Now, on with the show. Hey, everyone, welcome to the New Stack Makers. We have Dan Lorek with us today. He's founder and CEO at ChainGuard. We're doing a series of interviews with technical founders. And I thought of Dan because of his company, ChainGuard which has really risen in popularity quite quickly, in part due to, I think, probably Dan's brilliance, but in many <laughs> regards also to all of these issues that we're seeing in this software landscape, vulnerabilities galore, vulnerabilities in the software supply chain. Dan, wow, you've really got yourself, uh, you've really got yourself a full plate here. <laughs> yeah, we've got a mess of an industry to to kind of tackle here. Um, if you've been following the news at all, it might seem like the software industry is burning on fire or falling down or anything because of all of these security problems. Uh, it's bad news for a lot of for a lot of folks, but uh, it's good news if you're in the security space. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so Dan, tell us a little bit about ChainGuard, and then we'd love to hear more about you. Sure. So we are recording this at the end of July. <clears throat> ChainGuard got started at the end of October 2021. So we're like 10 months in, I think, if I'm doing that math correct. Um, something like that. So just under a year. Um, and it's been a, a pretty fast year, it feels like. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, before that, I was at Google for about nine years doing a bunch of cloud DevOps, security, open source security, developer experience, open source tools, all of that. Um, and so with the rise in uh, security being talked about in open source, and I want to say the rise in open source insecurity or something like that, just with you know the rise in prominence in this area, um, this kind of is a natural calling in the last couple of years. Hmm. What is, what called you? Uh, what, you know, what is it that really called you to start this company? Sure. Yeah, I think I'm um, just getting into the field in general, I guess, was probably the first one. And that was probably three or four years ago. Um, open source security and supply chain security weren't really buzzwords back then. Nobody was really talking about it. Um, and I kind of got paranoid about it when I first started working on open source um, at Google. The first open source project I, I really worked on um, on GitHub was uh, Minikube. Um, if you're familiar with Minikube, it's the official Kubernetes uh, development uh, project for laptops and you know, workstations. So you download Minikube from GitHub, you run a command, and you have Kubernetes running on your laptop. Um, that was the first code I ever wrote on GitHub was those first couple of commits in Minikube. It's probably 2015, 2016, something like that. Mm. Um, and when I actually got time to do the first release of Minikube, like V0.1.0 or something way back when, um, I was kind of shocked at the state of the art. Um, you know, at Google, we had all this secure production grade build and release infrastructure. Um, and then when you went to open source, it was uh, basically back to the Stone Ages. It was order a Mac Mini off of Amazon on your credit card, expense that, throw that under your desk or in a closet in the office, install Jenkins and ship these releases out to the world. Um, and uh, it was kind of weird. Nobody asked any questions. I did that and it worked. But I mean, this is like a 200 megabyte go binary that people were just running as root on their laptops across the whole uh, <laughs> Kubernetes community. And nobody had any idea what I put in there or if it matched the source that uh, was on GitHub or anything. So that was pretty terrifying. Um, and that got me paranoid about the space and kind of went down this long rabbit hole that eventually resulted in starting ChainGuard. <laughs> That's so interesting. <laughs> but I'm curious about the paranoia. Not so much paranoia, just more like a sense of 
wow, this is a lot of responsibility. Um, if anybody finds this laptop or this Mac mini under my desk, they could do bad things to like the whole Kubernetes community, basically. <laughs> um, so more like, you know, paranoid uh, about like, you know, the unwanted power and responsibility I had to do when releasing those uh, builds. Ah, how does that reflect, do you think, about your thinking in terms of your profession and the work that you do? You know, how does it reflect on your own uh, on, on val- your own values? Um, I think uh, it took a little bit of persistence. I don't want to say a ton, but I mean, when I started working on that problem um, a couple years later, nobody really cared or was worried about it. Um, nobody understood why I was worried about it, why I was bothering them, you know, to you know operate their CI CD stuff more securely, um, switching off of you know a lot of insecure by design systems. It just felt like we were pestering people for a while. Um, and not getting much traction. Um, and then, like, what happens in security? All it takes is one giant event to all of a sudden get everybody's attention. Um, and it, it didn't take forever. It's not, it's not like I was working on this for 20 years or, you know, 50 years by myself in a room. Um, it's just a couple of years. But um, when the uh, breach on solar winds happened at the end of 2020, that was kind of like a, a lightning moment. Um, all of a sudden, everybody cared about this. Um, and it was pretty much a perfect mirror to the, you know, what I was worried about. Um, what happened to them was a backdoor installed on a build machine that um, I was running in a closet or something like that um, wasn't being operated like the rest of their production infrastructure. Um, and that, you know, was a nightmare scenario for them, for all of their customers, um, including the U.S. government and, and people right. running software in secure environments. But who did you go to for support then to, you know, to say, hey, I don't get this. <laughs> um you mean early on yeah yeah because you mean, said there was but there were yeah. very few people who would like yeah. even listen to what you were saying yeah very few not uh not nobody i guess not, um, you know, no. it was a pretty small community yeah. um yeah i think uh especially in the open source world uh you know finding a bunch of the folks um the nyu secure systems lab i don't know if you mm. ever met them uh, yeah. justin capos and his yeah. whole crew the the update framework the intoto project um yeah the academics were ahead of us again in the industry <laughs> um for a while got connected with them and got to do some work um and then, I mean, some of the problems started to get lumped together, right? You hear supply chain security or something like that now, and it's a whole bunch of different problems all rolled into one. Um, and some of them did start to pick up. You know, you see Sneak and all these vulnerability scanners and Dependabot and all these tools that are now getting really good at finding bugs in open source software and helping you prevent um, that, which is still part of the same field, but um, a little bit different than kind of the, you know, malicious attack on a build server. But They all kind of get lumped together. But thankfully or unthankfully, I guess, um, enough of these things started to happen that uh, people started to pay attention. And so can you remember any conversation where becoming a founder started to surface in your discussions? Um, I mean, yeah, that was almost completely unrelated, actually. Um, yeah, I've, I've been working on, uh, you know, security started to pick up after the solar winds attack through that spring and summer. Um, and then some old coworkers of mine that I'd worked with years before then, I guess on some of the same problems, um, but I hadn't seen in a little while, uh, said, hey, do you guys want to do a startup? Um, looking for something new. This area you've been working on seems like a pretty hot space right now. Um, maybe we should do this. And it kind of seemed like a great idea instantly, <laughs> something I hadn't really been considering. Can you? Help us paint the picture. Were sure. you uh, were you at a cafe? Were you where, you know where were you? Were you on the phone? Were you on a Zoom call? Or were you what, what or IRC or what? I I think I was at a bar um, and uh, it was Matt Moore, my my co founder. Yeah. Matt Moore texted me. I hadn't talked to him in a couple months, and he just said, I, I don't remember the exact wording. It was just like, Hey, you want to do a startup? Um, I was like, Obviously, yeah. Um, if Matt Moore wants to do a startup, you say yes. <laughs> Uh, how do you know Matt? <laughs> I worked with Matt for years at Google. Um, and ironic, we didn't you know really think about it at the time, but we were working on a lot of the same problems of you know when containers first got popular um, in the early days of Docker. Um, and then he went off and worked on Knative and a bunch of other developer uh-huh, tools, yeah. and I went down the uh, security rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. So uh, wh- how do you complement each other? Um. <laughs> Matt is a great engineer and I'm not, I guess is how I put it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think it's, uh, it, it, 
a great group of folks that we well, have. What here. do you do then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, good question. Um, I ask I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, I I uh, my, my time gets split up pretty uh, pretty aggressively. I think there's a maybe there's that Twitter thread that you found or something. Somebody was asking me questions. It was like one third talking to customers, one third hiring one third going to meetings and one third talking to investors or something like that. <laughs> well, it seems like everyone knows Dan. I mean, yeah. that's just the impression I get like Dan Lorick. Oh yeah. Like, yeah, I know Dan, Matt, well, Matt, the, uh... Matt too. But what, what is that? Like, uh, have you just been a guy who just likes to chat with people a lot? I think that's one of the superpowers, I guess, in open source. Um, you yeah. know, it's a small community, but it's a, a lot bigger than it feels at first. Um, you know, if you've been in open source, especially in the container cloud world for five or six or seven years and been to conferences, you, you kind of get to know pretty much everybody, it feels like. Yeah, you really do. So what do you bring to the company in terms of values? What values does Matt bring? How did you merge those values? And how does that affect your everyday decision-making? Because you know, I'm a founder of the new stack and we, we focus on values from the very start. And I, I thank to my, I thank that to my, my, my better other half, Judy, who said, we got to write these down. We got to write down these values. We got to write down our mission, you know, and it actually has been instrumental in our decision-making over the years. And I'm curious, you know, it seems like chain guard's gotten off to a good start. And when you see a company that's gotten off to a good start, I'm always curious about what are those values? What are those belief systems that you have? Yeah, first, I think we probably, we, we, we did spend a lot of time on that. And first, even stepping back a little bit and figuring out like what, what values actually mean. Um, there's this awesome talk uh, from Brian Cantrell, who I'm sure you know, um, uh, from I don't know, probably five or six years ago about like what, what values actually are and how they're different from principles and how so many of these corporate ones end up as kind of meaningless. Um, and, uh, and he, you know, he kind of steps back a bit and he's like, values kind of have to be relative. You can't just value something. You can't value kindness or fairness or something like that. That's not a value. That's just like a kind of empty statement. Um, values are when you put things, you know, relative, some, you value X over Y, or it, it's about kind of trade-offs. Um, otherwise they're not useful. You can just kind of come up with a list of platitudes um, that don't really come up every day. Um, it's a really, really great talk. I wish I could remember the title right now off the top of my head, but if you search Brian Cantrell values, I'm sure you'll find it. We can probably get it in the show notes. Um, so we actually started there about how we would even go about phrasing these. Um, and I think, yeah, they do um, come up and they do help out uh, you know, our, our company's execution. And I think it's uh, because you can use them to make decisions and as a decision-making framework rather than just kind of good things about the world that we all agree with. Mm -hmm. So so tell me about those first days when you're writing those values and what are those values and what are, how would you how would you characterize them? Yeah, I think uh, probably the, the most relevant, I guess, to, the, to this conversation um, is a bias for action. Um, that one comes up all the time. Um, and it comes up with how we structure the teams, how we hire folks, um, you know, how we operate our company. Um, everybody's empowered to do what they think is you know, best and most aligned with our mission and the rest of the values. Um, if you don't know what to do, just do something. Right? Um, we don't have lengthy you know, processes and reviews and decision making and all of that. Um, if you screw up, that's fine, um, because then you can just correct it quickly as long as everybody keeps bias for action. Um, so I think that, that one probably comes up the most, especially in startup context. Um, if you try to operate a startup like a massive company um, where you do need a lot of that because of legal frameworks or regulatory systems um, and some mistakes can be incredibly costly, um, that's going to slow down velocity. So it's bias, you said? <laughs> yeah, bias for action. Where does that term come from? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, we didn't make too much of this up. You know, it was about, <laughs> we yeah. looked and compared from a bunch of yeah. other companies. Um, but yeah, if, if you don't know what to do, just do something. <laughs> and uh, how do you, how do you live by that? <laughs> oh man, that's like every morning I wake up and think about that. Um, you know, nothing frustrates me like, you know, unnecessary process or things being slowed down just for the sake of slowing things down. <laughs> yeah. So you're, so you, you just work on what you see needing to get done. Who are you hiring and, and who are you looking for and how are you thinking? I mean, have you, have you ever done a startup before? No, never. It's uh, my first one. So you're learning as you go. What are you learning about hiring right now? 
All of it. Um, yeah, hiring has been pretty, uh, pretty awesome and pretty fast for us. We've been really lucky there. Um, we were five people when we started back in October, and I think we're 46 right now. Um, so hiring has been awesome. Um, we've got you know, one of the best engineering teams I've ever worked with, um, and we're starting to grow our kind of sales and go to market and other functions right now. Wow, 46 people. Like, um, as a technical founder, you know, and Matt also being a technical founder, what what were you bringing to the table that you really wanted to see in people, and how did that result in who you hired? Yeah, I think a lot of this comes back to that superpower in open source, like I mentioned. You know, the, when you've forked in these communities for so long, your network gets so large that yeah. you can stay hiring in network for a very, very, very long time. Yeah, um, and that's the best. Um, you know, we don't have an interview process. We don't have anything formal like that because almost every single person we've hired has been people that we or the people we've hired um, have worked with for years and years and actually understand what it's like to work with these people. Um, so we've never posted. We've never sent out a job posting. We don't have any a careers page on our website. Um, we don't have recruiters. It's all been just network from starting with a group of great folks. So you really are uh, building it up from the from from the ground up, and you've been able to build out a network pretty pretty well. Uh, what new territory are you finding now that you've kind of built out a sizable engineering team? Uh, you know, for a company of your size. And so now what are the challenges for hiring as you see them coming forward, going forward? Because you can't hire engineers forever, right? No, no, no. Um, yeah, thankfully, uh, you know, we, we have worked with folks that aren't engineers before, so we do have some networks there. But um, yeah, it's not quite quite the same. Um, yeah, I think the challenges are, yeah, um, figuring out the those kind of approaches for other roles and you know it's easy to hire engineers when you've been an engineer for a decade you know what to look for uh, none of us have run a sales org before none of us have you know been in tech sales or done any of that um, so even figuring out what to look for who the best people in that field are um, it's you know a lot different than uh, something that you've been doing day to day for a decade as you build products out you know with that with, with that growing team uh, you released your first product as I recall right? That came out a few months ago, as I as I, as I remember. Uh, how are you then going into day two, and what kind? You know, what do you what have you learned in your prior work that you're bringing into that day two management? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the field we're in, and you know, this would this same approach would probably not work at all if we were doing like mobile apps or social networks or, or stuff like this, but um, <clears throat> we're building SaaS software for enterprises. Um, and, you know, that has a particular deployment model and a particular sales cycle and a particular, you know, usage model. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, problems with that. There's a lot of drawbacks, like slow sales cycles and many stakeholders involved. Um, but there's a bunch of benefits to it too. I mean, you can update it quickly. You can start with something early and find teams at a company willing to work with you and give you feedback day to day. Um, you don't have to release it to the entire world all at once. Um, you know, so you can work with a couple of early design partners that are really motivated to solve a problem um, and start with not much more than a working prototype and go from there to a production-ready product. So that's kind of been our approach. So, you know, there's there's a certain art to building products and, you know, technical founders uh, have insights and, you know, an understanding into that process. One of the things, you know, that I've seen is companies that try to build out too fast, right? Where they, they build a product and they keep adding features. Uh, and, uh, you know, and at some point, you know, uh, it's why, you know, why is this so complicated, right? How are you thinking about, you know, how are you thinking about those things? And have you had any learning lessons so far about, you know, something maybe that you were considering doing and decided not to or decide not to and realize and think that maybe I should have done that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the adding too many features, complexity stuff. I mean, it's the nature of software, right? You know, and entropy accrues over time, um, you know, unless you remove it. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there's a couple different ways that can manifest as a problem. So I'm not quite sure which one you were getting at, but, um, you know, there, there's the one pitfall people fall into where they spend way too long to launch the thing and don't get feedback there. And maybe they mm. show it to a couple of folks, get 10 feature requests from them and then spend, you know, three more months adding all of those before they show it to people again. And then when it's finally ready, they've got, you know, they spent a year kind of in stealth with hundreds of features. Um, and uh, it turns out that's not actually what people wanted or it's too complex by the time it launched or it's too late. 
Um, that's one model. The other one is just kind of what happens to products over time where you start with something simple um, and then it grows to a complex beast of you know, software um, and you know, new incumbents will come in and you know, be faster and more nimble and out compete with something simpler. Basic innovators dilemma stuff, I guess. So how um, would you, yeah. Go on. We're, we're too early for the second one. I mean, we're, we're barely going, so yeah. uh, we'll worry about that one a little bit later. Uh, but for the first one, yeah, we basically just tried to launch as early as we possibly could. I think we had a barely working demo when we threw it up on the website um, just to get people interested in trying it out. That was really the goal. Um, and it worked. So, yeah, we ended up with you know, a bunch of organizations trying out our products and development and tests and production environments um, and having us build those features for them just in time. You know, we're not collecting giant lists of features, merging them together and doing all of them. Um, it's really the, uh, all right, this is blocking me right now from paying you lots of money for this. Then it's a no-brainer. Of course, we'll go add that, that feature. How? How will you maintain that? Like, what are the ways you're thinking about maintaining that philosophy? Because that's a wonderful philosophy uh, to have. Yeah. I mean, the beauty of startups is you get to do stuff like that early on. Right. Uh, I mean, it's hard to do that in, you know, different environments. Right. Um, yeah, I think, you know, one of the other benefits of being small is you get to keep that feedback loop close. You don't have three levels of sales account managers and product managers and you know, project managers and engineering managers all between kind of the people implementing the feature and the customer. Um, when you're small, you just get to have the, you know, the engineers sit in the room and talk to the customers and um, you don't have to do all of that translation and distillation and everything. So keeping that feedback loop close, dog fooding our own software is another big one that helps out that way. Um, and again, that doesn't work for everybody. Um, but if you're building a product that your organization should be using, um, then you should be dog fooding it. And your engineers are, you know, your your first customer in that case. And we can find and fix stuff and solve quality of life issues before it even gets to customers because we do that aggressively. Mm -hmm. What are the what are the ways that you're trying not to get encumbered by slowing down, like? Because, uh, you know, like you said, you are a startup, but you do have 46 people. And, you know, even in a small group, there's going to be there's going to be people who have different opinions. Right. And that's just the nature of collaborating and being part of a community. So how are you thinking about going forward with that? Yeah. I mean, that's where the values come in. Um, you know, if we get stuck, if, you know, I mean, one of the problems we've run into is um, this is such a new area in security. Um, people know they're supposed to be scared of it, but they don't really know what they want, right? You can't just interview 100 customers and then figure out a perfect product because a lot of them are looking to us for guidance or don't know. They just want to be secure at the end of the day. Um, and so you've got to eventually just take a leap and say, all right, well, you know, we talked to 10 people and they couldn't give us the answer to how they want this to work. So we just have to guess and move forward um, and can't get stuck in kind of analysis paralysis or decision making on a lot of these. Um, you can't just ignore customers completely. That's kind of the, the flip side of that if you lean too much into it. Um, but there's a balance. And uh, if you're not getting the answers you need, you just kind of have to guess and you know, make sure that you can correct it if it's wrong. <laughs> and you know, the bias for action, how does that, how does that, how does it help with resolving conflicts? <laughs> um, it, you can kind of walk around them in a lot of cases. Um, you know, if there's two options and people are debating, just try them both, you know, do them both at the same time, do one, then the other. Um, you know, there's no, <clears throat> if decisions are quick and you can make them fast and roll them back fast, um, you kind of prevent conflicts from happening. Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah, we got stuck a couple times on, you know, should something work one way or the other way? And it turns out we can just do both ways. Um, and you can't do that forever. You know, stuff explodes exponentially. <clears throat> um, but uh, you can try both and show it to people and see which one they actually like when you get it in their hands. And so how do you then uh, uh, address that, you know, so interpersonal relationships remain healthy? Yeah, you just have to take ego out of it. Um, you know, we're not our decisions. Um, you know, we're just tr all trying to get to the same spot. And um, coming from a big tech company and, you know, kind of the opposite environment where, um, you know, it's harder to align missions and harder to get everybody vested in the same roles. Um, you've got to worry about promotion cycles and job ladders and all of these other things. Um, as long as, especially when you're small and this doesn't work forever, um, when everybody is vested in the success of the company and you, you believe everybody is operating genuinely with that interest in mind, it makes this a lot easier. What are you spending most of your time doing? 
Um, today, yeah, it's it's a mix. You know, like I said, uh, probably a, a mix of talking to customers, um, being in those meetings, um, running some of the teams and team meetings, hiring. Um, the market has slowed significantly this year, which probably most founders probably know about, but we're not stopping completely on hiring. So still keeping our eye out for great candidates. Um, and then, you know, getting my own work done, uh, getting updates out to the team, updates out to the board. That's really kind of your main role. How do you like that role? I mean, it's different than being an engineer. Is that a transit? Have you talked to other engineers about that? What it's like? Um, I didn't mind it. You know, I was managing teams before. I kind of like this, um, being able to jump around, you know, the style of, we have different problems each month, different problems each quarter, different focus area. The company is you get through different stages, um, and being able to deep dive into those as we start to build up those teams and make sure I understand them, um, well enough to hire folks and well enough to have them, you know, eventually, you know, get that delegated and, and run, you know, those orgs. Um, it's, I, I really enjoy so what do you think is your secret sauce then for that? What is it that you bring to it that, you know, that, that makes you, you know, naturally be able to jump around like that and talk to people? I get the sense that people, you know, uh, you know, accept kind of what you have to say because you're, you, you're pretty easy going about it. But what's your sauce? What's your secret sauce? What, what would you say it is? I thrive in the randomization, I guess. You know, I, I do much better that way. Um, I, I love it. Um, being able to, yeah, deep dive into one area for a month or two um, while we build that out and grow our muscle in that area and then switch to something else after that. Um, I guess, yeah, I have a lack of an attention span or something in one area. <laughs> I get to leverage it here. <laughs> so you, move like to, you like to go deep on, on small projects. Mm-hmm. And, and how does that contrast to Matt? He you know, is leading our, you know, engineering team now and doing a bunch of that, just more focused on coding and, you know, the technical aspects of it. I haven't opened an IDE in months at this point. Um, mm. it's, <laughs> it's a little sad. I should cu- try to find some more time just to at least play around with our products. Right. Okay. Cause you're kind of just managing the teams and getting feedback yeah. and, and like passing information around and doing all that. Uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, the question is like, if you have those skills, And, you know, Matt has his engineering skills and you're hiring in your network. Um, How do you know who else is out there? And because you're starting to get to that point, I think. And who will you be looking for? You know, will you be looking for people who have, you know, what are those other skill sets you'll be looking for? Like, you know, people who have experience with larger size organizations or what is it that you're, what you're needing and you think you're going to, it's going to help you improve upon your work that you do. Yeah, right now, um, the go-to-market kind of org and that kind of structure is, is what we're looking to hire and put into place. Um, we've been doing all the sales ourselves so far, learning as we go. Um, sales TikTok, interestingly enough, is, is really good. And I've learned a ton from that. I got somehow the algorithm routed me to like tech sales TikTok videos. Um, and that's been incredibly useful. Has it? Um, yeah, yeah, surprisingly. Nobody believes me when I tell them that. But, um, yeah, we have a little Slack channel of just all the TikToks that I watched and sent out that were that were useful. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're going now in the next couple of months. But it'll be slow, a lot slower than it would have been last year when the market was different. I love text. I love TikTok. <laughs> which one are you on yeah what, what's your front page like <laughs> you know um, you don't have to say yeah, we can I, do this I, one off the record i just i <laughs> know it's fine I, I i just i just scroll through the home feed really yeah, basically yeah. and like the algorithm picks stuff out for me i saw yeah. a great one from robert reich yesterday on inflation <laughs> which i really enjoyed Oof. um there's some of them that are just super hilarious yeah but like you know you know, I'm a founder. I don't have much time for anything, yeah. right? Like as you do, right? But I, but you know, I'm a lousy golfer. <laughs> and so I like to go out and hit the golf ball. So every once yeah. in a while, I'll watch a TikTok golf video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, or something Sometimes like that. Sometimes those come by. I don't yeah. even golf and I like watching those. So. <laughs> Some of them, I mean, yeah. I, there's like a different kind of a medium now. I think yeah. TikTok is a different medium and like a different style that comes with it, which I really like. Yeah. We just started our company TikTok channel. It's been pretty oh, good. Oh, so you far. did? Yeah. Why'd you do that? 
Just for fun? Yeah, just to see how it worked. You know, it, a lot of our inbound leads and everything have come from social media, mostly Twitter and LinkedIn so far. And so uh, get, give that new platform a try and see if it works out. So are you making them or who's making them? Uh, a bunch of folks on the team are recording them. Um, yeah, it's been it's been fun so far. Like, is, it, is this supposed to be fun? Is it supposed to be, what is it? It's pretty funny stuff. We'll mix in some actual educational stuff soon. <laughs> What's the TikTok address so we can find just it? Just Chain Guard Dev, I think. Think. <laughs> All right. I'm going to look yeah. it up now. Chain. So that seems to be kind of like a philosophy that you have is like bias to action for action, you know, get stuff done. You know, mm -hmm. I imagine the TikTok thing just came up as something like might be fun to do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we you know we did a little retrospective, I guess, and saw where most of the leads we we had so far came in, and it was a lot of Twitter and LinkedIn. So let's try a different one and see if it works. If it doesn't work, we'll just stop. You know? Well, Dan, thanks so much uh, for for talking with me. I guess my last question is, what was the first computer you got? Like, and you know, and uh, did you program or you were you a gamer? What tell me about that first computer? Oh man, uh, I don't remember the first computer I had, um, but I didn't get into programming until pretty late. Um, it was like halfway through college. Oh really? Um, I was actually yeah, I actually majored in mechanical engineering, so okay. it's kind of all the opposite. Um, and I got into programming because we had to do simulations and stuff in MATLAB. Ah. Um, so that was my first programming language was MATLAB, um, and then switched over to Python because it was pretty close and similar, and we didn't need those licenses or whatever that we needed yeah. for MATLAB. <laughs> um, and then I was like, oh, this is much faster than you know ordering parts and going to the machine. <laughs> machine shop and reserving time. So I got, got into it that way. <laughs> nice. What did you like doing as a high schooler then? What was your kind of your interests? Yeah, all the the physical side. I was like, you know, cars. I used to race stock cars. Did um, you? you know, yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, good. Well, Dan, thanks for taking some time. Good to chat with you a little bit, get to know you a little bit about yeah. uh, your background and your philosophy about Chain Guard. Everyone, check out Chain Guard. They're, they, they are... They are kind of one of the hot companies in the startup space out there. And boy, like open source security, I we should talk more about that because I love to know more about all the kind of the all the kind of the the crazy vulnerabilities that that uh, are possible out there because I'm sure there's just you know a, a list that could go on and on. But uh, we'll save that for another time. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. All right, Dan. Take it easy. Have a good one. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.